Thanks for checking out this movie review video. This is for the 1974 film Beyond the Door, and it's an Italian film, but it's dubbed into English, much like a lot of Italian films of the 70s and 80s that were horror. They did that type of thing in order to get international market, uh, which, you know, made them pretty profitable. So Beyond the Door had caught my interest, and I was like, I need to watch this because a, there was a trailer that I had seen on Shudder, which, by the way, that's where I watched this film was on Shudder. Uh, the trailer looked really good. Now, is the film as good as what the trailer showed? No, but I do think this film is definitely worth seeing once at least. Uh, at least the first about half of the film is probably worth watching again. After that, it really slows down and kind of gets a little incoherent at the same time. It's very weird after that, but um, definitely worth uh, enjoying once because it is kind of one of those films where it's so so quirky, so weird, so bad that it's fun, at least for like the half, first half of the film. But anyway, since this is an older film, this is a spoiler review. So before I go any further, if you haven't seen the film, just stop here. I would recommend seeing it, like I said, at least once. So just go check it out and then come back. So this film was directed by Ovidio G. Asinitis, who did the films uh, Tentacles, Madhouse, which I have seen Madhouse and I enjoyed, and Over the Line, and also Robert Barrett, who was involved in directing, who did Over the Line as well. Uh, written by Asinitis, Barrett, Antonio Troiso, Giorgio Marini, Aldo Crudo, Alex Rebar, Christopher Cruz, and Sonia Molteni. Yes, eight people involved with the script. Now I say eight people involved because not all those people actually were involved in the physical writing of it. There were a bunch of the people who had story elements that they put into it. So that's why I say involved. So eight people involved in the script. And it's usually my, uh, my experience with films like that, where it's a lot of people working on one script, that it kind of becomes a mess. And this film is no exception. That's why it kind of falls into the territory of like, so bad it's good. I don't think it's like an overall good film because it is... It's all over the place. It's quirky. It's weird. It's incoherent. Like I said, like the last half, pretty incoherent. And it's just like, it's out there. And that's a lot of what you get. But I think another component of it is this kind of what Italians think, at least back then, what Italians think of uh, Americans at that point. Because this is done by an Italian director and a lot of Italian writers uh, with Barrett involved as well, who's American, but it, it seems very much like an outsider's view of like, oh yeah, this is what Americans are like. Not really. Uh, but it, all the interior stuff was actually done in Rome and all of the exterior stuff was done in San Francisco because it's supposed to take place in San Francisco. So it's supposed to feel American, but it doesn't really, it's, it's interesting. So it ended up costing $350,000, and it ended up making $15 million. It did really, really well, which is really awesome. And if you like this film, if you've seen this film and you really like it, and you're like, man, I'd love to own that, Arrow Video actually has a Blu-ray of it right now. But the film is actually initially called, even though it's going by Beyond the Door right now, it was initially called The Devil Within Her. And you actually see that if you watch it on Shudder the title actually comes up as The Devil Within Her, so it's another one of those things. Um, the film Hellmaster, which I also watched and have a review for, I don't know when I'm putting that out. It might already be out on my channel, but Hellmaster is the same situation. That film was called Them, but it's Hellmaster on Shudder, but it still has that title of Them in it. It's weird. So critics actually hated the film and said it was a ripoff of The Exorcist, which... There are definitely things in this film that are a ripoff of The Exorcist, but I think it's also a ripoff of Rosemary's Baby. It's just basically those two ideas just mashed together in a much less coherent, less well thought out, more meandering type way. Because a lot of the times it feels like they have an idea of what they want to do, but then they just don't do much with it. Like, they don't add a whole lot of story. You know what the core concept of it is, and that's pretty much all there is there. Like, you see the core concept throughout the film, but not a whole lot gets added to it, and at, like, an hour and a half runtime, actually a little bit more than an hour and a half runtime, it just seems like the film's just stretched out so thin on how much time you should have been able to get out of that concept. 
Or actually, I mean, you could have still kept it very simple and got a lot of good stuff out of the concept if they did more of the practical effects stuff, if they showed more of the actual possession stuff. But like I said, like once they hit about the halfway point, they just kind of give up on trying to entertain people uh, for the most part. There are a few things that then kind of pop in, but there's a lot of moments of people just kind of being in places and you're just like, okay, and then kind of rehashing stuff that has already taken place or we have already established in the film. So, yeah. So Mario Bava's film Shock, and it actually ended up being rebranded afterwards to Beyond the Door Part 2 in 1977. Now, it has absolutely nothing to do with the first Beyond the Door, but for purposes of trying to sell, you know, get better sales on it, they just change it to Beyond the Door 2. And then there was even a connect. Uh, there was even a film of Beyond the Door three that was released in 1989, which also had absolutely nothing to do with the original or the sequel. <laughs> uh, that's something that's happened before Italian film back then. They did that from time to time. Uh, interior. Oh, I already talked about the interior shots and everything. Uh, starting the movie with a black screen is an intro. Oh, I totally. I totally skipped over this. Sorry. Backpedal. Critics hated the film, right? But obviously the fans did did quite like it. And I think a lot of that being the year before The Exorcist came out. Now, there was an actual lawsuit that happened from Warner Brothers about how much of a ripoff it was of The Exorcist. And they ended up settling outside of court. So there was actual litigation with this film of how much it was like The Exorcist. Now, why they weren't sued about, you know, for how much it was like Rosemary's Baby, I don't know. I guess maybe it's because they took more of, like, the imagery from The Exorcist, and they didn't really take as much of the imagery from Rosemary's Baby. They took more of just, like, the concept. So maybe that's why. So anyway, starting the movie with a black screen and someone talking really isn't a good idea. It's not very appealing. It's not engaging. It doesn't really pull the audience in, um... I guess it's a way to make people really focus on what's being said, but it's just not very catching. You know, it doesn't grab you. Like, you kind of need to be grabbed in the beginning of the film. Uh, it looked really funny because when the woman's naked body was laying there on the pentagram, and then they had, like, the face laid over her head of, like, the dude, it looked like it was, like, Jesus' head. And I was like, is that Jesus' head on a woman's body? Is that, like, nipple Jesus? Well, he would have nipples anyway. Like, I think I said titty Jesus when I was watching it with a friend. But yeah, it was so random. Uh, they use a lot of image laid over um, laid over each other. You know, two Im images laying over each other in the beginning a lot. And then they do it at the end again. And it looks awful. It is a stupid idea. It is very distracting. It doesn't visually look good at all. And it just, it doesn't actually accomplish much. I mean, I understand the idea of, like, overlaying the guy's head on the woman's head during the pentagram part. Like, that makes sense because it's, like, important for the film. But all the other times they use that idea, it doesn't really have that much importance to the actual film. And it looks like garbage. So, yeah. Terrible stuff. The intro song is awesome, though. The music in general is really good in this. Uh, in particular, that intro song. It's really funky. It's really fun and cool. I love that scene. That scene is great. Uh, kind of makes you want to move. Makes you want to groove to that music. Uh, showing the woman get everything on her grocery list is unbelievably excessive. Uh, in the beginning, um, I forget what her name is. Je uh, Jennifer. Jennifer, I believe. When she's going out grocery shopping. Um, they just, like, they show way too much of things in this. Especially, like, mundane daily life things. Like, prime example, like I'm saying. Showing this woman get a lot of things at the grocery store when you definitely don't need to do that. And once again, it's just like stretching the film, stretching the film for no reason. It gets boring. It gets very boring. But that's just kind of a funny thing in the beginning. And then also the fact that you see her kid, Ken, drinking soup, drinking pea soup from a Campbell's can. Which, by the way, I theorize that that's a way that they kind of draw the connection for you for the end of the film between Ken having been possessed by the demon all along and then it kind of passes over to Jennifer um, because when it's in Jennifer, there's all that kind of like green stuff coming out of her mouth that's like pea soup. 
versus Ken is drinking that pea soup all the time. So it's like when the demon is in Ken, he's consuming all the pea soup. Then when the demon is in, demon is in Jennifer, the pea soup's all coming out. So that was kind of a um, visual cue, like a visual like clue for people to to understand at the end. Oh, there was this little clue there all along that the demon was in Ken and then in Jennifer. So because that's like the big reveal at the end with Ken's glowing eyes after he throws that little car over the over the side of the boat, which is you know kind of a weird moment, obviously. The mouths on those kids, Ken and Gail. Oh my gosh, the amount of profanity coming out of those kids' mouths. And so early in the film, like that's what catches you about it being so quirky and weird and so bad it's fun. Um, but then that really calms down when you hit about the halfway point because they actually get rid of the kids in the film. And they're kind of the best part of it because you really never know what they're going to say. You really never know how they're going to react to anything. And it's, um, yeah, yeah. I mean, even, like, uh, something really to point out is the part where Gail is making food. She's making, like, a cake or something. And she's talking about, like, putting arsenic in it. And, like, she's making poisoned food for her family. Like, this stuff is so weird and random. So weird and random. It's crazy. So was the destruction of the fish tank an urge from the demon that was within her, I guess, the demon baby, because that's another thing that kind of plays in this film. When Jennifer's pregnant, she says that she feels like the baby's trying to, like, strangle her from the inside. Now, that kind of indicates that the baby is possessed, and maybe that's actually what they're going to. So I was having a hard time figuring out throughout the film, and this is what I was talking about with being kind of, like, incoherent, because sometimes it seems like Jennifer is possessed. Sometimes it feels like she's talking about the baby being possessed because she's, like, feeling evil things about the baby, or maybe it's a situation where the baby is possessed, therefore the baby then influences the body, kind of like a puppet master type thing. I don't know. It, it, it's very kind of mind-boggling because, like, how does that concept work? We're just used to possession films from the standpoint of the demon possesses a body. But with this, the demon kind of moves and possesses multiple bodies. So I guess maybe it's a situation where sometimes it's just possessing the baby inside of her. Sometimes it's fully possessing her. Sometimes it's possessing Ken. You know, all that stuff. So it's it's crazy, man. The levitation in this film, when uh, Jennifer gets out of bed and she starts levitating and then moving out of the room, that actually looked pretty good. I would assume that something from 1974 like that would not look that great nowadays, but it actually looked well, and I think they pulled it off. So nice work. Italian horror from this time travels a, or feels a lot, uh, travels a lot throughout the film. What? Italian horror from this time travels a lot throughout the film. I don't understand what I was putting there. They like to show a lot of different locations. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Sorry, sometimes my own notes. Yeah, so uh, there's a lot of kind of like showing you the scenery, showing you different places. That is something that Italian horror from this time period really does like to do is just kind of show you the architecture, show you the community, show you all the buildings, show you all these different locations and just kind of take you on a journey like you're a bit of a tourist. And I like that about those films. It's cool. It gives you a lot to look at. Now, unfortunately, a lot of that goes away towards the end of the film and then, you know, things are boring, but... You know, if things are boring, taking you around and showing you a lot of stuff kind of helps. Why was the mom making out with Ken? That's a really weird point. Uh, her kid, and then she punches Gail in the face. I assume that's kind of, well, I assume, I'm, I'm sure that that's the demon doing stuff to her. But that's some crazy stuff to put in a film, especially back then, of like her making out with her child and then punching her other child in the face. But it also makes for these moments that just shock you and you're like, I did not see that coming. That's that's something. They just did that. That's crazy. And, you know, you laugh. I laugh. Um, so there's a demon possessing Jessica and a demon baby at the same time. Well, that's another concept that I wrote down. I was like, so are there two demons? Like, and that's the thing. Like, it's hard to just keep figuring out, like, what is actually going on? Is it just the demon, the demon baby possession? Is it... Jessica being possessed by a demon. Is it the baby has a demon and Jessica has a demon? I don't know. Someone in the comments, please. 
the kid's room, like the possession type stuff going on in the kid's room with all that light coming through the slats, like all the wooden boards and how the, the room was like kind of moving. That scene was awesome. That was so good. And then also leading up to that, all the creepy stuff with those dolls, that was really good too. That stretch of film was a really good portion of the film that's very engaging, looks very impressive and cool, and it's probably my favorite portion of it other than the beginning when you first find out that these kids are extremely foul-mouthed and out there whenever someone says the child must be born that really means there's a demon baby i mean just think about every single film you've seen where someone says the child must be born it's because it's a demon baby or it's going to be the antichrist or something like that it's never a good sign and the other thing is it's something that as an audience member now you hear it and you're like demon demon Jessica moving just one eye was freaky and cool at the same time. That moment when she's laying in bed and just the one eye, both her eyes are open, but just the one eye is moving, nuts. So I'm assuming how they did that was they kind of like put like a prosthetic eye over one of them. So she was actually moving both of her eyes at that time and it just didn't look like she was, but it looked good. It looked very impressive. It looked real too. So I don't know, maybe she just had that talent. Once Jessica has the yellow eyes and is vomiting green goo, you start to see the stuff stolen from The Exorcist, obviously, because that's kind of a hallmark of The Exorcist, especially since the film had just come out a year prior. So anyone seeing Beyond the Door, aka The Devil Within Her, would be like, this is just like The Exorcist. And also the voice. The changing of the voice is very much the same. A lot of the stuff that she says is very similar to the stuff that was being said by Regan in The Exorcist. So yeah, they took a lot from that. They take their sweet time getting anywhere in the film. It seems like they needed to create a lot of filler because the story just isn't there. I already kind of talked about that. That's one of the biggest problems with this film. And I think if that wasn't happening, I would like this a lot more. The scene with Dimitri in the apartment after Robert leaves is unbelievably drawn out and pointless where he's kind of like up against the mirror for a while as it's shaking and then he's just kind of walking around and he's like looking at the door and it's all that stuff with Dimitri as soon as he shows up towards the end the end portion of the film it's going to get insanely boring. They do throw in a few interesting, you know, moments that perk you up, but for the most part not so good. The portion with Robert on the street with the musicians crowding him while he walks is unbelievably hilarious, especially because there's a dude playing like a recorder flute with his nose. I mean, it's wacky. Like, and this is what I'm talking about with this film being so quirky and weird and wacky. Those are the moments I love. Those are the moments I look for in this film. And how extended that shot is, is fine because it's so funny and weird. You're just like, how is this guy not losing it and, like, shoving these street musicians away? He's just, like, totally fine with just, like, quickly walking and they just follow him as a group. It's just it's such a funny concept. The movie had points where it pauses quickly while the audio is uninterrupted, which was really weird. Now, I don't know if this has to do anything with the version that was put on Shutter or them having technical issues when I was watching it. But literally, there would be moments where the, the visuals would freeze, but the audio keeps going, and then it would snap back. It did it numerous times, and I was watching it with a friend over the phone, and he said the same thing was happening. So I'm assuming it's that version of the film. I assume it wasn't done intentionally. I would hope it wasn't done intentionally, because it's terrible. But yeah. The reveal of Dimitri having already died would have been way more impactful if they hadn't started the film with him going off the cliff in his car. Um, because like, you know, he was in the situation to die. It would have been much better if they kind of inter just introduced him as like this dude. And then slowly you start to understand that like he's in league with the demon. And then they do the big reveal of, oh my God, he's been dead all the time. And then that would have impact. But the fact that you knew that he was already going to die and they even talk about it in the beginning of the film with the voiceover, it just doesn't have impact. You're just like, oh, okay. It could have been like a really whoa moment had they not had that in the beginning. This demon won't shut the hell up. That's another thing. It was so annoying. 
how much Jennifer as the demon just kept talking and talking and talking and talking. It's like, okay, like with a lot of scenes in this, I was talking about just stretching it out, stretching it out. It's like, we, we got it. We can move on now. Um, I already talked about the pea soup connection at the end. It is kind of a cool end to the film. Um, you know, him throwing the car over and then the eyes and stuff. And you're like, wait a minute. It was Ken all the time. He was a demon from the beginning. Wow. Uh, the film goes from being quirky and fun to slow and incoherent. I already talked about that. That's so true. It's very much like Rosemary's Baby with the fears of pregnancy and the future of your children. That is something that's a big thing that gets played with in horror a lot as, as far as themes and subtext of, you know, just having this fear that, Having children will change you, which is at play in here, you know, into a demon, but also the kids coming out and being bad. You know, you can only control so much with a kid. You can try and try and try and do everything you can, but what if they're born with problems? Or even though you do your best job to raise those children, they end up being bad people, or they end up being a demon, in a sense. Yeah, so... That's kind of what's going on with the film. So, in the end, I'm very glad I saw this film... Maybe I'd watch it another time, but I might check out around the halfway point because, like I was saying, it just gets so slow and bad at that point. But So I'm going to kind of have to rate this on two scales again in, you know, how is it as an actual film and then how is it as a so bad it's good film. So as a how is it as an actual film, it's not terrible as an actual film, I'm, but I'm, I'm going to give it one and a half stars. I'm going to go with a one and a half. Now, as far as a so bad it's good film, I'm going to go two and a half just because, like I said, like half the film is that good time. Well, no, I'm going to upgrade it to a three because there are a few other cool moments in the second half of the film. So three, we're going to go three. That's good enough. So anyway, introduce your friends to this film because it's definitely worth seeing once. It's a you have to see it to believe it type thing. Um, and it's fun, and I look forward to finding more gems like this, which I'm sure Shudder will keep producing. Um, not producing, but, you know, putting forward, putting on their service so I can find them. We can all find them. So anyway, uh, put some comments down there. Your thoughts on Beyond the Door. I've seen some people on social media really freaking out about it in a good way, like, oh my god, I love it, it's so great. So put some comments down here. Do you love it? Do you hate it? Are you in between? Have you not seen it? In which case, why are you going this far in the review? I don't know. But do me a quick favor, hit that subscribe button, and uh, yeah, it means a whole lot to me. It helps me with growing the channel, which obviously I'm trying to do. And then um, make sure you hit the notification bell if you're going to do that, though, because then you know anytime I'm putting up a new review or doing a live stream or any of that jazz. So regardless, thank you for checking this out, and until next time, keep it brutal.